talk to us about these aspects. And uh, the, the, the session moderator or this, the chairman of today's session is Mr. Patrick Reines, who is standing in front of you. He is from the French uh, uh, nuclear industry. He has a, a lot of experience. And some of you might have seen him as a project guide and uh, associated with him. And uh, we also have uh, uh, Andrea, my colleague from IAEA. He's a senior legal expert from IAEA. Uh, he would be also talking to you subsequently. Uh, followed by that, we are going to talk about uh, legal aspects of IAEA safeguards. There is a safeguards legal expert coming from IAEA, uh, Sylvain, uh, who would be showing up here sh soon. In the afternoon, he will talk about these aspects briefly. And also, we have another expert, William Folk from uh, the Pillsbury Company. Uh, he would also share uh, his uh, information and thoughts. So a lot of things to talk about today about the legal aspects. So without wasting much time, I will hand it over to uh, Patrick Reiners to take the proceedings of the day. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Ashok, with No problem. Could you hear me? Yeah. And actually, today, one of my hats is to be the Secretary General of what is the International Nuclear Law Association, that is the as World Association of Specialists of Nuclear Law. Maybe I uh, may say a word about this at the end, at the close of our day. Our busy day, certainly. Uh, you may wonder, at least rhetorically, why devoting uh, one particular day in this dense program on, on management to legal aspect. Uh, the, the point is that you have covered already since the beginning of the course a variety of important subjects, radiation protection, nuclear safety, security, waste management, non-proliferation safeguards. And all these aspects, I'm sure you realize that, independently of your personal background, are based on, on needs to be based on a strong legal foundation. Now that's essentially why we uh, have decided to devote this particular day to the legal aspect. Our program today is uh, indeed quite comprehensive. Uh, and, and it will, uh, and therefore very compact. It will extend from uh, nuclear safety to new build, including liability, uh, non-proliferation, security. Um, and will therefore invite, uh, propose to invite you to put some questions within the limited time after each particular presentation, which is also why I will ask my dear colleagues starting with Prophet Joya, um, to try to limit to their allocated times, including myself with my first presentation. So very briefly, nuclear law in eight questions. Why a special law for nuclear energy? The point is that nuclear activities involve risk, special risk, which needs to be severely, strictly controlled, managed. If there were no benefit associated with the use of nuclear energy, nuclear materials, then life would be simpler. You would simply prohibit any such activities. Some activities involving radioactive materials are prohibited. For example, 
you cannot introduce radioactive materials into toys or some general consumption product because the advantage does not offset the risk. So interdiction is a rule, that's simple. But when you have to, to consider that there is sufficient benefit, then you, of course, you must introduce specific legal arrangement to protect the population. So this is one of the essential aspects of this activity. It is an activity at risk. As a common thread of all nuclear law, all aspects, even remote aspects like, safe, like safeguards, the common thread of all nuclear law is the existence of radioactivity and the risk associated with radioactivity. Of course, one must not also ignore the historical origin of nuclear energy that is started with a military program. And today, you, as somebody said, you cannot de-invent the bomb. So you have to live with this legacy of the military applications. A law closely associated with science and technology, I need not insist on that. A multidisciplinary legal system, because uh, the regulation of nuclear activities involves a number of very specific elements of law, like radiation protection law, safety, security, but they also associate with branches of law which are not nuclear specific, like, for example, transport or energy. A strong influence of state policies and interventions in most practically all countries, at least if you talk about the generation of electricity, of energy with nuclear, these are highly strategic programs, programs of extreme national importance. The influence of the state in policy making is very strong. The existing existence of the risk requires also the state to regulate strictly these activities. So overall, a very strong influence. High level of international, internationalization. Uh, it does transpire through the complex architecture of international instruments, which we'll be introducing in the course of, of the day. But also, the original point is that nuclear law started in existence, started to be developed shortly after the Second World War. And all the countries, interested countries, combined their expertise, combined their strength into working together to develop common rules. And this is rather unique uh, when you compare that with the regulation of other activities. And of course, the IEA has been the central point of such internationalization. And a close inter interaction with environmental law. Nuclear law, in fact, predates environmental law. The turning point was in 1972 with the United Nations Convention in Stockholm on environmental law, a declaration of principles. At that time, it was recognized that there were interactions between nuclear law and environmental law on a number of aspects. Since the ever non irresistible expansion of environmental law means that today modern environmental law does include, does introduce and encompass a large aspect of nuclear, nuclear law per se. Not all, of course. Non-proliferation is foreign to environmental law, at least to a large degree. But to a large extent, then the frontier between environmental law and nuclear law are kind of blurred. The main branch that is reflected by our program today, by the program of this course, I need not to insist, except that nuclear security 
covers also aspects of physical protection, illicit traffic, terrorism, for example. Transport is very important when you deal with nuclear safety. And when you talk about the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons, you must not forget that there are aspects of management of industry program in respect of nuclear energy. That therefore raises the question of whether the policy of trade, the policy of exports is consistent with the objectives, policy objective of non-proliferation. That requires specific arrangements. And of course, liability compensation. When the prevention of accident has failed, then you must, of course, confront the question of compensation. An objective, generally, it, there is a consensus to formulate it as here, a legal framework for the conduct of activities relating to nuclear energy and ionizing radiation. This is very important. It's, it's not only the operation of large nuclear, nuclear power reactors, it's also in every day the use of radioactive material for a variety of medical and other purposes that adequately protect individuals, property, and the environment. Although, let's be honest, in most international instruments, there is a reference to the protection of the environment. This is politically obligatory today. You will not find much specific provisions in respect of the protection of the environment in international nuclear instruments. An effort at definition, the body of special legal norms to regulate, control the conduct of persons engaged in activities related, again, fissionable materials and other materials emitting radiation. Principles. I guess most, you, most of these principles are very familiar with, to you. I don't think I need to elaborate much on that because I, my understanding that they have already been introduced to a large extent. I would uh, simply maybe mention that in with, by continuous control of by competent authorities, this is a policy to ensure that any material, any activity does not escape regulatory control from grave, from cradle to grave. That's, and this is the same policy which applies to the law on nuclear liability. And in respect of the separation of regulatory and promotional functions, this is today reflected in the Nuclear Safety Convention, for example, 1994. But 20 years, it was introduced uh, some uh, 30 years before 20 years before, sorry, are uh, in the United States by a decision to split the old Atomic Energy Commission in two new instruments, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission on the one side and the ERDA, now the Department of Energy, on, on the other side. As often, this uh, policy was initiated in the United States and then it spread in most of the countries. You might wish to add, but it is not nuclear specific, you might wish to add at this list of principles, the precautionary principles. Are you familiar with the precautionary principles? It's a principle re, uh, which appears now in a number of instruments, not specifically nuclear instruments, in, in national laws, which suggests that when uh, a risk is identified, though, in fact, the scientific foundation of this risk are still somewhat uncertain, as a precaution, you should suspend the use, the application of the application of this activity un un unless and until the matter can be clarified. So, it's not an, a day-to-day -day ordinary prudence uh, principle, which is some, something that everybody should follow. It's, uh, it's an anticipation on the existence of a reach which is not yet, yet completely understood. 
and therefore controlled. Culture, I guess that is very clear for you. I will not elaborate. I remember that there was a discussion yesterday about the distinction between the concept of safety culture and the concept of security culture. So again, I do not wish to elaborate. Uh, it's not, it's worth to say and to acknowledge the limits of law. You cannot really legislate and control safety culture. You integrate safety culture, you integrate security culture, but while you can ex ex express this in terms of objective, you cannot effectively state by law you will abide by safety culture. It's something which must come from you. That's typically a, a f something which, phenomenon which is cultural. And how nuclear law, to conclude, does fit in the national legal framework? It's part of hierarchy. On top, you have constitutions of states. And in most states, international treaties regularly adopted, con confirmed, are on the same level as the constitutions, which means that they are a step above ordinary national laws. National laws must conform with the commitment under international treaty. That there are exceptions, but that is the case for most countries. You may ask yourself, is that the case for my particular country? We can discuss it. Below the legislative levels, of course, Act of the Parliament, and below the regulatory level, acts of government, such as decrees, ordinances, orders, uh, whatever. And then you have non-mandatory guidance documents. And uh, there is a particular case of the license conditions, which are, to some extent, from a legal viewpoint, are partly regulatory, partly contractual, because the license con confirms rights and obligations to a given individual company, person, and that person commits to abide by the conditions of the license. So there is a contractual dimension in the licensing exercise. Would it be possible to show the other table with you? I thank you. And that will be the end of my presentation. New covering. Yes, this other uh, diagram, which I borrowed from my former NEA colleagues, shows things slightly differently by showing something which is very important, which is the distinction between what you might call the hard law and the soft law. A soft law, are you familiar with the concept of soft law? All right. Well, typically, any government body entrusted by its own constitution to take, make regulations is enacting such regulations and all citizens of the country must abide by this regulation. Otherwise, they may be subject to a variety of sanctions. So it's effective and mandatory. But it has proved in the course, not only in, in respect of nuclear activities, it's very true for the protection of the environment, for example, but it has proved over time useful, convenient to enact arrangements which have a, a normative nature, which are legal nature, but which are not, however, strictly mandatory. Very often, these elements of soft law are either kind of anticipatory on the development of strict regulations, 
or alternatively, they have a nature which, although it is regulatory, it, it, is not, it does not benefit from being imposed as a strict regulation. And there are advantages to that. Because uh, particularly when you want to develop international instruments, if you uh, decide that such rules will be mandatory, then, of course, all countries must seek it two times, twice, before accepting these rules, because they know that they will be responsible for, to enforce them. Uh, these rules though reflecting a very large international consensus may create some difficulties for them on one or the other aspect. So to stay on the level of recommendations, this is the expression used by the IEA executive bodies, for example, to stay on the level of recommendations facilitates the dissemination of these good practices, best practices, for example, of these scientific and technical recommendations. And then they come short of making it mandatory, because to make them mandatory in the process of formulation of this norm might crystallize opposition. Even if there is a scientific and technical consensus by experts concerned in the formulation, so one country would say, ah, ah, it does not, it does not coincide with the way I'm doing things at the moment. That's going to create problem at home. So I'm going to vote against. And therefore, you have sometimes the law of the lowest common denominator. Everything which creates a problem for the country is removed. So again, one advantage of soft law arrangement, provided they are scientifically authoritative, the advantage of soft law instruments is that they can effectively be implemented with a greater flexibility and without breaking uh, sometimes the, uh, the ob opposition of individual countries. So soft law has been much used in the context of nuclear energy and all the very wide sector of IEA technical recommendations, this is soft law. But in a moment, for example, Professor Joya will introduce instruments which are hard law or positive law, as you may call it. So that pyramid reflects this arrangement between hard law and soft law, and uh, being clearly understood that if you talk of legislation, if you talk of, of course, constitutional treaties, if you talk of regulations per se, these are effectively mandatory. But on the top, then you have a large series of instruments which belong to the category of soft law. This is uh, what I wish to introduce. Uh, and we'll proceed now to the first presentation of our today's program. And that presentation will be introduced by Professor Andrea Gioia. Andrea, uh, you, you're Italian, by the way. And uh, you have been, uh, you have had a distinguished academic career, particularly teaching at the University of Modena, which is not very, very far from here. Uh, but you joined uh, several years ago ZIA. I remember that maybe you will conf confirm that your f first appearance in an IEA meetings, one of the occasions of the revision of the Vienna Convention on Nuclear Liability as part of the Italian delegation. And uh, for good or bad reasons, you, it was felt that you, you could not uh, escape the IEA to propose you to stay first uh, as a consultant, and then now you are firmly established in the Office of Nuclear Law 
uh, of the IEA as senior legal officer. It, it should be said that uh, the IEA has wide responsibilities involving nuclear activity, nuclear law activity. And uh, besides its functions as supporting the operation of the Vienna Agency, the Office of Nuclear Affairs is a boutique, is really a, a, a shop, but I'm saying that with due respect, of specialists of, uh, of nuclear law. And uh, we are, it's our privilege today to have uh, several of IAEA colleagues coming to make presentation, starting with you, Andrea. Thank you very much.